preface to modern essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales modern essays selected by christopher morley preface it had been my habit i am now aware to speak somewhat lightly of the labors of anthologists to insinuate that they led lives of bland sedentary ease i shall not do so again when the publisher suggested a collection of representative contemporary essays i thought it would be the most lenient of tasks but experience is a fine aperitif to the mind indeed the pangs of the anthologist if he has conscience are burdensome there are so many considerations to be tenderly weighed personal taste must sometimes be set aside in view of the general plan for every item chosen half a dozen will have been affectionately conned and sifted and perhaps some favourite pieces will be denied because the authors have reasons for withholding permission it would be enjoyable for me at any rate to write an essay on the things i have lingered over with intent to include them in this little book but have finally sacrificed for one reason or another how many times twenty at least i have taken down from my shelf mr chesterton's the victorian age in literature to reconsider whether his ten pages on dickens or his glorious summing up of decadence and aesthetes were not absolutely essential how many times i have palpitated upon certain passages in the education of henry adams and in mr wells outline of history which i assured myself would legitimately stand as essays if shrewdly excerpted but i usually concluded that would not be quite fair i have not been over scrupulous in this matter for the essay is a mood rather than a form the frontier between the essay and the short story is as imperceptible as is at present the once famous mason and dixon line indeed in that pleasant lowland country between the two empires lie to my way of thinking some of the most fertile fields of prose fiction that expresses feeling and character and setting rather than action and plot fiction beautifully ripened by the lingering mild sunshine of the essayist's mood this is fiction i might add extremely unlikely to get into the movies i think of short stories such as george gissing's in that too little known volume the house of cobwebs which i read again and again at midnight with unfailing delight fall asleep over forget and again reread with undiminished satisfaction they have no brilliance of phrase no smart surprises no worked-up situations which have to be taken at high speed to pass without breakdown over their brittle bridgework of credibility they have only the modest and faintly melancholy savour of life itself yet it is a mere quibble to pretend that the essay does not have easily recognisable manners it may be severely planned or it may ramble in ungirdled mood but it has its own point of view that marks it from the short story proper or the merely personal memoir that distinction easily felt by the sensitive reader is not readily expressible perhaps the true meaning of the word essay an attempt gives a clue no matter how personal or trifling the topic may be there is always a tendency to generalize to walk round the subject or the experience and view it from several vantages instead of as in the short story cutting a carefully landscaped path through a chosen tract of human complication so an essay can never be more than an attempt for it is an excursion into the endless any student of fiction will admit that in the composition of a short story many entertaining and valuable elaborations may rise in the mind of the author which must be strictly rejected because they do not forward the essential motive but in the essay of an informal sort we ask not relevance to plot but relevance to mood that is why there are so many essays that are mere marking time the familiar essay is easier to write than the short story but it imposes equal restraints on a scrupulous author for in fiction the writer is controlled and limited and swept along by his material 
but in the essay the writer rides his pen a good story once clearly conceived almost writes itself but essays are written there also we find a pitfall of the personal essay the temptation to become too ostentatiously quaint too deliberately whimsical the word which by loathsome repetition has become emetic the fine flavor and genius of the essay as in bacon and montaigne lamb hazlitt thackeray thoreau perhaps even in stevenson is the rich bouquet of personality but soliloquy must not fall into monologue one might put it thus that the perfection of the familiar essay is a conscious revelation of self done inadvertently the art of the anthologist is the art of the host his tact is exerted in choosing a congenial group making them feel comfortable and at ease keeping the wine and tobacco in circulation while his eye is tenderly alert down the bright vista of tablecloth for any lapse in the general cheer it is well also for him to hold himself discreetly in the background giving his guests the pleasure of clinching the jape and seeking only by innocent wiles to draw each one into some characteristic and felicitous vein i think i can offer you in this parliament of philomaths entertainment of the most genuine sort and having said so much i might well retire and be heard no more but i think it is well to state as even the most bashful host may do just why this particular company has been called together my intention is not merely to please the amiable dilettante though i hope to do that too i made my choices first and foremost with a view to stimulating those who are themselves interested in the arts of writing i have to be frank a secret ambition that a book of this sort may even be used as a small but useful weapon in the classroom i wanted to bring it home to the student that as brilliant and sincere work is being done to-day in the essay as in any period of our literature accordingly the pieces reprinted here are very diverse there is the grand manner there is foolery there is straightforward literary criticism there is pathos politics and the picturesque but every selection is in its own way a work of art and i would call the reader's attention to this that the greater number of these essays were written not by retired aesthetes but by practising journalists in the harness of the daily or weekly press the names of some of the most widely bruited essayists of our day are absent from this roster not by malice but because i desired to include material less generally known i should apologize i suppose for the very informal tone of the introductory notes on each author but i conceived the reader in the role of a friend spending the evening in happy gossip along the shelves pulling out one's favorites and talking about them now and then reading a chosen extract aloud and ending some time after midnight by choosing some special volume for the guest to take to bed with him in the same spirit i have compiled this collection perhaps the editorial comments have too much the manner of dressing-gown and slippers but what a pleasant book this will be to read in bed and perhaps this collection may be regarded as a small contribution to anglo-american friendliness of course when i say anglo i mean brito but that is such a hideous prefect journalists on this side are much better acquainted with what their professional colleagues are doing in britain than they with our concerns but surely there should be a congenial fraternity of spirit among all who use the english tongue in print there are some of us who even imagine a day when there may be regular international exchanges of journalists as there have been of scholars and students the contributions to this book are rather evenly divided between british and american hands and perhaps it is not insignificant that two of the most pleasing items come from canada where they often combine the virtues of both sides readers note here follows a long paragraph of acknowledgments which we will not read End note. christopher morley october nineteen twenty one End preface.
essay one of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay one american literature by john macy this vigorous survey of american letters is the first chapter of john macy's admirable volume the spirit of american literature published in nineteen thirteen a book shrewd penetrating and salty which has unfortunately never reached one-tenth of the many readers who would find it permanently delightful and profitable mr macy has no skill in vaudeville tricks to call attention to himself no shafts of limelight have followed him across the stage but those who have an eye for criticism that is vivacious without bombast austere without bitterness keen without malice know him as one of the truly competent and liberal-minded observers of the literary scene mr macy was born in detroit in eighteen seventy seven graduated from harvard in eighteen ninety nine did editorial service on the youth's companion and the boston herald and nowadays lives pensively in greenwich village writing a good deal for the freeman and the literary review perhaps if you were wandering on fourth street east of sixth avenue you might see him treading thoughtfully along with a wide sombrero hat and always troubled by an iron-gray forelock that droops over his brow you would know as soon as you saw him that he is a man greatly lovable i like to think of him as i first saw him some years ago in front of the bright hearth of the charming st botolph club in boston where he was usually the centre of an animated group of nocturnal philosophers the essay was written in nineteen twelve before the very real reawakening of american creative work that began in the teens of this century the reader will find it interesting to consider how far mr macy's remarks might be modified if he were writing to-day the spirit of american literature has been reissued in an inexpensive edition by bonnie and liverwright it is a book well worth owning american literature is a branch of english literature as truly as are english books written in scotland or south africa our literature lies almost entirely in the nineteenth century when the ideas and books of the western world were freely interchanged among the nations and became accessible to an increasing number of readers in literature nationality is determined by language rather than by blood or geography m maeterlinck born a subject of king leopold belongs to french literature mr joseph conrad born in poland is already an english classic geography much less important in the nineteenth century than before was never among modern european nations so important as we sometimes are asked to believe of the ancestors of english literature beowulf is scarcely more significant and rather less graceful than our tree inhabiting forebears with prehensile toes the real progenitors of english literature are greek latin hebrew italian and french american literature and english literature of the nineteenth century are parallel derivatives from preceding centuries of english literature literature is a succession of books from books artistic expression springs from life ultimately but not immediately it may be likened to a river which if swollen throughout its course by new tributaries and by the seepages of its banks it reflects the life through which it flows taking color from the shores the shores modify it but its power and volume descend from distant headwaters and affluents far upstream or it may be likened to the race life which our food nourishes or impoverishes which our individual circumstances foster or damage but which flows on through us strangely impersonal and beyond our power to kill or create it is well for a writer to say away with books i will draw my inspiration from life for we have too many books that are simply better books diluted by john smith at the same time literature is not born spontaneously out of life every book has its literary parentage and students find it so easy to trace genealogies that much criticism reads like an old testament chapter of begats every novel was suckled at the breasts of older novels and great mothers are often prolific of anemic offspring 
the stalk falls off and revives goes a-wandering and returns like a prodigal the family records get blurred but of the main fact of descent there is no doubt american literature is english literature made in this country its nineteenth-century characteristics are evident and can be analyzed and discussed with some degree of certainty its american characteristics no critic that i know has ever given a good account of them you can define certain peculiarities of american politics american agriculture american public schools even american religion but what is uniquely american in american literature poe is just as american as mark twain lanier is just as american as whittier the american spirit in literature is a myth like american valor in war which is precisely like the valor of italians and japanese the american deluded by a falsely idealized image which he calls america can say that the purity of longfellow represents the purity of american home life an irish englishman mr bernard shaw with another falsely idealized image of america surprised that a face does not fit his image can ask what is poe doing in that galley there is no answer you never can tell poe could not help it he was born in boston and lived in richmond new york baltimore philadelphia professor van dyke says that poe was a maker of decidedly un-american cameos but i do not understand what that means facts are uncomfortable consorts of prejudices and emotional generalities they spoil domestic peace and when there is a separation they sit solid at home while the other party goes irving a shy sensitive gentleman who wrote with fastidious care said it has been a matter of marvel to european readers that a man from the wilds of america should express himself in tolerable english it is a matter of marvel just as it is a marvel that blake and keats flowered in the brutal city of london a hundred years ago the literary mind is strengthened and nurtured is influenced and mastered by the accumulated riches of literature in the last century the strongest thinkers in our language were englishmen and not only the traditional but the contemporary influences on our thinkers and artists were british this may account for one negative characteristic of american literature its lack of american quality true our records must reflect our life our poets enamoured of nightingales and persian gardens have not altogether forgotten the mockingbird and the woods of maine fiction written by inhabitants of new york ohio and massachusetts does tell us something of the way of life in those mighty commonwealths just as english fiction written by lancashire men about lancashire people is saturated with the dialect the local habits and scenery of that county but wherever an english-speaking man of imagination may dwell in dorset or calcutta or indianapolis he is subject to the strong arm of the empire of english literature he cannot escape it it tears him out of his obscure bed and makes a happy slave of him he is assigned to the department of the service for which his gifts qualify him and his special education is undertaken by drill-masters and captains who hail from provinces far from his birthplace dickens who writes of london influences bret hart who writes of california and bret hart influences kipling who writes of india each is intensely local in subject matter the affinity between them is a matter of temperament manifested for example in the swagger and exaggeration characteristic of all three california did not produce bret hart the power of dickens was greater than that of the sierras and the golden gate bret hart created a california that never existed an indian gentleman caucasian and hindu tell us that kipling invented an army and an empire unknown to geographies and war offices the ideas at work among these english men of letters are world encircling and fly between book and brain the dominant power is on the british islands and the prevailing stream of influence flows west across the atlantic sometimes it turns and runs the other way poe influenced rossetti whitman influenced henley for a century cooper has been in command of the british literary marine 
literature is reprehensibly unpatriotic even though its votaries are as individual citizens afflicted with local prides and hostilities it takes only a dramatic interest in the guns of yorktown its philosophy was nobly uttered by gaston paris in the collège de france in eighteen seventy when the city was beleaguered by the german armies common studies pursued in the same spirit in all civilized countries form beyond the restrictions of diverse and often hostile nationalities a great country which no war profanes no conqueror menaces where souls find that refuge and unity which in former times was offered them by the city of god the catholicity of english languages and literature transcends the temporal boundaries of states what then of the provincialism of the american province of the empire of british literature is it an observable general characteristic and is it a virtue or a vice there is a sense in which american literature is not provincial enough the most provincial of all literature is the greek the greeks knew nothing outside of greece and needed to know nothing the old testament is tribal in its provinciality its god is a local god and its village police and sanitary regulations are erected into eternal laws if this racial localism is not essential to the greatness of early literatures it is inseparable from them we find it there it is not possible in our cosmopolitan age and there are few traces of it in american books no american poet has sung of his neighborhood with naive passion as if it were all the world to him whitman is pugnaciously american but his sympathies are universal his vision is cosmic when he seems to be standing in a city street looking at life he is in a trance and his spirit is racing with the winds the welcome that we gave whitman betrays the lack of an admirable kind of provincialism it shows us defective in local security of judgment some of us have been so anxiously abashed by high standards of european culture that we could not see a poet in our own backyard until european poets and critics told us he was there this is queerly contradictory to a disposition found in some americans to disregard world standards and proclaim a third-rate poet as the milton of oshkosh or the shelley of san francisco the passage in lowell's fable for critics about the american bulwers disraelis and scots is a spoonful of salt in the mouth of that sort of gaping village reference of dignified and self-respecting provincialism such as professor royce so eloquently advocates there might well be more in american books our poets desert the domestic landscape to write pseudo elizabethan dramas and sonnets about mont blanc they set up an artificial tennyson park on the banks of the hudson beside the shores of lake michigan they croon the love affairs of an arab in the desert and his noble steed this is not a very grave offence for poets live among the stars and it makes no difference from what point of the earth's surface they set forth on their aerial adventures a wisconsin poet may write very beautifully about nightingales and a new england unitarian may write beautifully about cathedrals if it is beautiful it is poetry and all is well the novelists are the worst offenders there have been few of them they have not been adequate in numbers or ingenious to the task of describing the sections of the country the varied scenes and habits from new orleans to the portlands and yet small band as they are with great domestic opportunities and responsibilities they have devoted volumes to paris which has an able native corps of story-makers and to italy where the home talent is first-rate in this sense american literature is too globe-trotting it has too little savor of the soil of provincialism of the narrowest type american writers like other men of imagination are not guilty to any reprehensible degree it is a vice sometimes imputed to them by provincial critics who view literature from the office of a london weekly review or from the lecture-rooms of american colleges some american writers are parochial for example whittier others like mr henry james are provincial in outlook but cosmopolitan in experience and reveal their provinciality by a self-conscious internationalism 
probably english and french writers may be similarly classified as provincial or not mr james says that poe's collection of critical sketches is probably the most complete and exquisite specimen of provincialism ever prepared for the edification of men it is nothing like that it is an example of what happens when a hack reviewer's work in local journals is collected into a volume because he turns out to be a genius the list of poe's victims is not more remarkable for the number of nonentities it includes than the lives of the poets by the great dr johnson who was hack for a bookseller and introduced all the poets that the taste of the time encouraged the bookseller to print poe was cosmopolitan in spirit his prejudices were personal and highly original usually against the prejudices of his moment and milieu hawthorne is less provincial in the derogatory sense than his charming biographer mr james as will become evident if one compares hawthorne's american notes on england written in the long ago days of national rancor with mr james's british notes on america the american scene written in our happy days of spacious vision emerson's ensphering universality overspreads carlyle like the sky above a volcanic island indeed carlyle who knew more about american life and about what other people ought to do than any other english writer earlier than mr chesterton justly complains that emerson is not sufficiently local and concrete carlyle longs to see some event man's life american forest or piece of creation which this emerson loves and wonders at well emersonized longfellow would not stay at home and write more about the excellent village blacksmith he made poetical tours of europe and translated songs and legends from several languages for the delight of the villagers who remain behind lowell was so heartily cosmopolitan that american newspapers accused him of anglomania which proves their provincialism but acquits him mr howells has written a better book about venice than about ohio mark twain lived in every part of america from connecticut to california he wrote about every country under the sun and about some countries beyond the sun he is read by all sorts and conditions of men in the english-speaking world and he is an adopted hero in vienna it is difficult to come to any conclusion about provincialism as a characteristic of american literature american literature is on the whole idealistic sweet delicate nicely finished there is little of it which might not have appeared in the youth's companion the notable exceptions are our most stalwart men of genius thoreau whitman and mark twain any child can read american literature and if it does not make a man of him it at least will not lead him into forbidden realms indeed american books too seldom come to grips with the problems of life especially the books cast in artistic forms the essayists expounders and preachers attack life vigorously and wrestle with the meaning of it the poets are thin moonshiny meticulous in technique novelists are few and feeble and dramatists are non-existent these generalities subject to exceptions are confirmed by a reading of the first fifteen volumes of the atlantic monthly which are a treasure-house of the richest period of american literary expression in those volumes one finds a surprising number of vigorous distinguished papers on politics philosophy science even on literature and art many talented men and women whose names are not well remembered are clustered there about the half-dozen salient men of genius and the collection gives one a sense that the new england mind aided by the outlying contributors was in its one age of thought an abundant and diversified power but the poetry is not memorable except for some verses by the few standard poets and the fiction is naive edward everett hales the man without a country is almost the only story there that one comes on with a thrill either of recognition or of discovery it is hard to explain why the american except in his exhortatory and passionately argumentative moods has not struck deep into american life why his stories and verses are for the most part only pretty things nicely unimportant 
anthony trollope had a theory that the absence of international copyright threw our market open too unrestrictedly to the british product that the american novel was an unprotected infant industry we printed dickens and the rest without paying royalty and starved the domestic manufacturer this theory does not explain for there were many american novelists published read and probably paid for their work the trouble is that they lacked genius they dealt with trivial slight aspects of life they did not take the novel seriously in the right sense of the word though no doubt they were in another sense serious enough about their poor productions uncle tom's cabin and huckleberry finn are colossal exceptions to the prevailing weakness and superficiality of american novels why do american writers turn their backs on life miss its intensities its significance the american civil war was the most tremendous upheaval in the world after the napoleonic period the imaginative reaction on it consists of some fine essays lincoln's addresses whitman's war poetry uncle tom's cabin which came before the war but is part of it one or two passionate hymns by whittier the second series of the bigelow papers hales the man without a country and what else the novels laid in wartime were either sanguine melodrama or absurd idols of maidens whose lovers are at the front a tragic theme if tragically and not sentimentally conceived perhaps the bullet that killed theodore winthrop deprived us of our great novelist of the civil war for he was on the right road in a general speculation such a might have been is not altogether futile if milton had died of whooping cough there would not have been any paradise lost the reverse of this is that some geniuses who works ought inevitably to have been produced by this or that national development may have died too soon this suggestion however need not be gravely argued the fact is that the american literary imagination after the civil war was almost sterile if no books had been written the failure of that conflict to get itself embodied in some masterpieces would be less disconcerting but thousands of books were written by people who knew the war at first hand and who had literary ambition and some skill and from all these books none rises to distinction an example of what seems to be the american habit of writing about everything except american life is the work of general lew wallace wallace was one of the important secondary generals in the civil war distinguished at fort donelson and at shiloh after the war he wrote ben-hur a doubly abominable book because it is not badly written and it shows a lively imagination there is nothing in it so valuable so dramatically significant as a week in wallace's war experience ben-hur fit work for a country clergyman with a pretty literary gift is a ridiculous inanity to come from a man who has seen the things that wallace saw it is understandable that the man of experience may not write at all and on the other hand that the man of secluded life may have the imagination to make a military epic but for a man crammed with experience of the most dramatic sort and discovering the ability and the ambition to write for him to make spurious oriental romances which achieve an enormous popularity the case is too grotesque to be typical yet it is exceptional in degree rather than in kind the american literary artist has written about everything under the skies except what matters most in his own life general grant's plain autobiography not art and of course not attempting to be is better literature than most of our works in artistic forms because of its intellectual integrity and the profound importance of the subject matter our dreamers have dreamed about many wonderful things but their faces have been averted from the mightier issues of life they have been high-minded fine-grained eloquent in manner in odd contrast to the real or reputed vigor and crudeness of the nation in the hundred years from irving's first romance to mr howell's latest unromantic novel most of our books are eminent for just those virtues which america is supposed to lack their physique is feminine they are fanciful dainty reserved 
they are literose sophisticated in craftsmanship but innocently unaware of the profound agitations of american life of life everywhere those who strike the deeper notes of reality whitman thoreau mark twain mrs stowe in her one great book whittier lowell and emerson at their best are a powerful minority the rest beautiful and fine in spirit too seldom show that they are conscious of contemporaneous realities too seldom vibrate with a tremendous sense of life the jason of western exploration writes as if he had passed his life in a library the ulysses of great rivers and perilous seas is a connoisseur of japanese prints the warrior of sixty-one rivals miss marie corelli the mining engineer carves cherry stones he who is figured as gaunt hardy and aggressive conquering the desert with the steam locomotive sings of a pretty little rose in a pretty little garden the judge haggard with experience who presides over the most tragic comic divorce court ever devised by man writes love stories that would have made jane austen smile mr arnold bennett is reported to have said that if balzac had seen pittsburgh he would have cried give me a pen the truth is the whole country is crying out for those who will record it satirize it chant it as literary material it is virgin land ancient as life and fresh as a wilderness american literature is one occupation which is not overcrowded in which indeed there is all too little competition for the newcomer to meet there are signs that some earnest young writers are discovering the fertility of a soil that has scarcely been scratched american fiction shows all sorts of merit but the merits are not assembled concentrated the fine is weak and the strong is crude the stories of poe hawthorne howells james aldrich bret harte are admirable in manner but they are thin in substance not of large vitality on the other hand some of the stronger american fictions fail in workmanship for example uncle tom's cabin which is still vivid and moving long after its tractarian interest has faded the novels of frank norris a man of great vision and high purpose who attempted to put national economics into something like an epic of daily bread and herman melville's moby dick a madly eloquent romance of the sea a few american novelists have felt the meaning of the life they knew and have tried sincerely to set it down but have for various reasons failed to make first-rate novels for example edward eggleston whose stories of early indiana have the breath of actuality in them mr e w howe author of the story of a country town harold frederick a man of great ability whose work was growing deeper more significant when he died george w cable whose novels are unsteady and sentimental but who gives a genuine impression of having portrayed a city and its people and stephen crane who dead at thirty had given in the red badge of courage and maggie the promise of better work of good short stories america has been prolific mrs wilkins freeman mrs annie trumbull slosson sarah orne jewett roland robinson h c bunner edward everett hale frank stockton joel chandler harris and o henry are some of those whose short stories are perfect in their several kinds but the american novel which multiplies past counting remains an inferior production on a private shelf of contemporary fiction and drama in the english language are the works of ten british authors mr galsworthy mr h g wells mr arnold bennett mr eden philpotts mr george moore mr leonard merrick mr j c snaith miss may sinclair mr william de morgan mr morris hewlett mr joseph conrad mr bernard shaw yes and mr rudyard kipling beside them i find but two americans mrs edith wharton and mr theodore dreiser there may be others for one cannot pretend to know all the living novelists and dramatists yet for every american that should be added i would agree to add four to the british list however a contemporary literature that includes mrs wharton's ethan fromm and mr dreiser's jenny gerhardt 
both published last year, is not to be despaired of. In the course of a century a few Americans have said in memorable words what life meant to them. Their performance, put together, is considerable, if not imposing. Any sense of dissatisfaction that one feels in contemplating it is due to the disproportion between a limited expression and the multifarious immensity of the country. Our literature, judged by the great literatures contemporaneous with it, is insufficient to the opportunity and the need. The American spirit may be figured as petitioning the muses for twelve novelists, ten poets, and eight dramatists to be delivered at the earliest possible moment. End of Essay 1 Essay 2 of Modern Essays, selected by Christopher Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 2, Mary White, by William Allen White. Mary White. One seems to know her after reading this sketch written by her father on the day she was buried, would surely have laughed unbelievingly if told she would be in a book of this sort, together with Joseph Conrad, one of whose books lay on her table. But the pen, in the honest hand, has always been mightier than the grave. This is not the sort of thing one wishes to mar with clumsy comment. It was written for the Emporia Gazette, which William Allen White has edited since 1895. He is one of the best known, most public-spirited, and most truly loved of American journalists. He and his fellow Kansan, E. W. Howe of Atchison, are two characteristic figures in our newspaper world, both masters of that vein of canny, straightforward, humane, and humorous simplicity that seems to be a Kansas birthright. Mr. White was born in Emporia in 1868. The Associated Press reports carrying the news of Mary White's death declared that it came as the result of a fall from a horse. How she would have hooted at that! She never fell from a horse in her life. Horses have fallen on her and with her. I'm always having to hold them in my lap, she used to say but she was proud of few things and one was that she could ride anything that had four legs and hair her death resulted not from a fall but from a blow on the head which fractured her skull and the blow came from the limb of an overhanging tree on the parking the last hour of her life was typical of its happiness she came home from a day's work at school topped off by a hard grind with the copy on the high school annual and felt that a ride would refresh her. She climbed into her khakis, chatting to her mother about the work she was doing, and hurried to get her horse and be out on the dirt roads for the country air and the radiant green fields of the spring. As she rode through the town on an easy gallop, she kept waving at passers-by. She knew everyone in town. For a decade the little figure with the long pigtail and the red hair ribbon has been familiar on the streets of Emporia, and she got in the way of speaking to those who nodded at her. She passed the curs, walking the horse in front of the normal library, and waved at them, passed another friend a few hundred feet further on, and waved at her. The horse was walking, and as she turned into North Merchant Street, she took off her cowboy hat, and the horse swung into a lope. She passed the triplets and waved her cowboy hat at them, still moving gaily north on Merchant Street. A gazette carrier passed, a high school boy friend, and she waved at him, but with her bridle hand. The horse veered quickly, plunged into the parking where the low-hanging limb faced her, and while she still looked back waving, the blow came. But she did not fall from the horse. She slipped off, dazed a bit, staggered and fell in a faint she never quite recovered consciousness but she did not fall from the horse neither was she riding fast a year or so ago she used to go like the wind but that habit was broken and she used the horse to get into the open to get fresh hard exercise and to work off a certain surplus energy that welled up in her and needed a physical outlet that need has been in her heart for years 
it was back of the impulse that kept the dauntless little brown-clad figure on the streets and country roads of this community and built into a strong muscular body what had been a frail and sickly frame during the first years of her life but the writing gave her more than a body it released a gay and hearty soul she was the happiest thing in the world and she was happy because she was enlarging her horizon she came to know all sorts and conditions of men charlie o'brien the traffic cop was one of her best friends w l holtz the latin teacher was another tom o'connor farmer politician and rev j h j rice preacher and police judge and frank beach music master were her special friends and all the girls black and white above the track and below the track in pepville and stringtown were among her acquaintances and she brought home riotous stories of her adventures she loved to rollick persiflage was her natural expression at home her humor was a continual bubble of joy she seemed to think in hyperbole and metaphor she was mischievous without malice as full of faults as an old shoe no angel was mary white but an easy girl to live with for she never nursed a grouch five minutes in her life with all her eagerness for the out of doors she loved books on her table when she left her room were a book by conrad one by galsworthy creative chemistry by e e slosson and a kipling book she read mark twain dickens and kipling before she was ten all of their writings wells and arnold bennett particularly amused and diverted her she was entered as a student in wellesley in nineteen twenty two was assistant editor of the high school annual this year and in line for election to the editorship of the annual next year she was a member of the executive committee of the high school y w c a within the last two years she had begun to be moved by an ambition to draw she began as most children do by scribbling in her school books funny pictures she bought cartoon magazines and took a course rather casually naturally for she was after all a child with no strong purposes and this year she tasted the first fruits of success by having her pictures accepted by the high school annual but the thrill of delight she got when mr ecord of the normal annual asked her to do the cartooning for that book this spring was too beautiful for words she fell to her work with all her enthusiastic heart her drawings were accepted and her pride always repressed by a lively sense of the ridiculousness of the figure she was cutting was a really gorgeous thing to see no successful artist ever drank a deeper draught of satisfaction than she took from the little fame her work was getting among her schoolfellows in her glory she almost forgot her horse but never her car she used the car as a jitney bus it was her social life she never had a party in all her nearly seventeen years wouldn't have one but she never drove a block in the car in her life that she didn't begin to fill the car with pickups everybody rode with mary white white and black old and young rich and poor men and women she liked nothing better than to fill the car full of long-legged high school boys and an occasional girl and parade the town she never had a date nor went to a dance except once with her brother bill and the boy propositions didn't interest her yet but young people great spring-breaking varnish-cracking fender-bending door-sagging carloads of kids gave her great pleasure her zests were keen but the most fun she ever had in her life was acting as chairman of the committee that got up the big turkey dinner for the poor folks at the county home scores of pies gallons of slaw jam cakes preserves oranges and a wilderness of turkey were loaded in the car and taken to the county home and being of a practical turn of mind she risked her own christmas dinner by staying to see that the poor folks actually got it all not that she was a cynic she just disliked to tempt folks 
while there she found a blind colored uncle very old who could do nothing but make rag rugs and she rustled up from her school friends rags enough to keep him busy for a season the last engagement she tried to make was to take the guests at the county home out for a car ride and the last endeavor of her life was to try to get a restroom for colored girls in the high school she found one girl reading in the toilet because there was no better place for a colored girl to loaf and it inflamed her sense of injustice and she became a nagging harpy to those who she thought could remedy the evil the poor she had always with her and she was glad of it she hungered and thirsted for righteousness and was the most impious creature in the world she joined the congregational church without consulting her parents not particularly for her soul's good she never had a thrill of piety in her life and would have hooted at a testimony but even as a little child she felt the church was an agency for helping people to more of life's abundance and she wanted to help she never wanted to help for herself clothes meant little to her it was a fight to get a new rig on her but eventually a harder fight to get it off she never wore a jewel and had no ring but her high school class ring and never asked for anything but a wrist watch she refused to have her hair up though she was nearly seventeen mother she protested you don't know how much i get by with in my braided pigtails that i could not with my hair up above every other passion of her life was her passion not to grow up to be a child the tomboy in her which was big seemed to loathe to be put away forever in skirts she was a peter pan who refused to grow up her funeral yesterday at the congregational church was as she would have wished it no singing no flowers save the big bunch of red roses from her brother bill's harvard classman heavens how proud that would have made her and the red roses from the gazette force in vases at her head and feet a short prayer paul's beautiful essay on love from the thirteenth chapter of first corinthians some remarks about her democratic spirit by her friend john h j rice pastor and police judge which she would have deprecated if she could a prayer sent down for her by her friend carl now and opening the service the slow poignant movement from beethoven's moonlight sonata which she loved and closing the service a cutting from the joyously melancholy first movement of tchaikovsky's pathetic symphony which she liked to hear in certain moods on the phonograph then the lord's prayer by her friends in the high school that was all for her pallbearers only her friends were chosen her latin teacher w l holtz her high school principal rice brown her doctor frank von cannon her friend w w finney her pal at the gazette office walter hughes and her brother bill it would have made her smile to know that her friend charlie o'brien the traffic cop had been transferred from sixth and commercial to the corner near the church to direct her friends who came to bid her good-bye a rift in the clouds in a gray day threw a shaft of sunlight upon her coffin as her nervous energetic little body sank to its last sleep but the soul of her the glowing gorgeous fervent soul of her surely was flaming in eager joy upon some other dawn End of Essay 2 Essay 3 of Modern Essays Selected by Christopher Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 3, Niagara Falls by Rupert Brooke. The poet usually is the best reporter, for he is an observer, not merely accurate, but imaginative, self-trained to see subtle suggestions, relations, and similarities. This magnificent bit of description was written by Rupert Brooke as one of the letters sent to the Westminster Gazette describing his trip in the United States and Canada in 1913. It is included in the volume Letters from America, to which Henry James contributed so affectionate and desperately unintelligible a preface, one of the last things James wrote 
Brooks' notes on America are well worth reading. They are full of delightful and lively comments, though sometimes much, oh, very much, too condescending. The last paragraph in the essay is interesting in view of subsequent history. Brooks was born in 1887, son of a master at rugby school, was at King's College, Cambridge, died of blood poisoning in the Aegean, April 23, 1915. Samuel Butler has a lot to answer for. But for him, a modern traveler could spend his time peacefully admiring the scenery instead of feeling himself bound to dog the simple and grotesque of the world for the sake of their too human comments. It is his fault if a peasant's naivete has come to outweigh the beauty of rivers and the remarks of clergymen are more than mountains. It is very restful to give up all effort at observing human nature and drawing social and political deductions from trifles and to let oneself relapse into wide-mouthed worship of the wonders of nature. And this is very easy at Niagara. Niagara means nothing. It is not leading anywhere. It does not result from anything. It throws no light on the effects of protection, nor on the facility for divorce in America, nor on corruption in public life, nor on Canadian character, nor even on the Navy Bill. It is merely a great deal of water falling over some cliffs. But it is very remarkably that the human race, apt as a child to destroy what it admires, has done its best to surround the falls with every distraction, incongruity, and vulgarity. Hotels, powerhouses, bridges, trams, picture postcards, sham legends, stalls, booths, rifle galleries, and sideshows frame them about. And there are touts. Niagara is the central home and breeding place for all the touts of earth. There are touts insinuating, and touts raucous, greasy touts, brazen touts, and upper-class, refined, gentlemanly, take-you-by-the-arm touts, touts who intimidate and touts who wheedle, professionals, amateurs, and dilettante, male and female, touts who would photograph you with your arm around a young lady against a faked background of the sublimest cataract, touts who would bully you into cars, charabancs, elevators, or tunnels, or deceive you into a carriage and pair, touts who would sell you picture postcards, moccasins, sham Indian beadwork, blankets, teepees, and crockery, and touts, finally, who have no apparent object in the world, but just purely, simply, merely, incessantly, indefatigably, and ineffugibly to tout and in the midst of all this, overwhelming it all, are the falls. He who sees them instantly forgets humanity. They're not very high, but they are overpowering. They are divided by an island into two parts, the Canadian and the American. Half a mile or so above the falls on either side, the water of the great stream begins to run more swiftly and in confusion. It descends with ever-growing speed. It begins chattering and leaping, breaking into a thousand ripples, throwing up joyful fingers of spray. Sometimes it is divided by islands and rocks. Sometimes the eye can see nothing but a waste of laughing, springing, foamy waves, turning, crossing, even seeming to stand for an instant erect, but always borne impetuously forward like a crowd of triumphal feasters. Sit close down by it, and you see a fragment of the torrent against the sky, mottled, steely, and foaming, leaping onward in far-flung, criss-cross strands of water. Perpetually the eye is on the point of descrying a pattern in this weaving, and perpetually it is cheated by change. In one place part of the flood plunges over a ledge a few feet high, and a quarter of a mile or so long, in a uniform and stable curve. It gives an impression of almost military concerted movement, grown suddenly out of confusion. But it is swiftly lost again in the multitudinous tossing merriment. Here and there a rock close to the surface is marked by a white wave that faces backwards and seems to be rushing madly upstream, but is really stationary in the headlong charge. 
but for these signs of reluctance the waters seemed to fling themselves on with some foreknowledge of their fate in an ever wilder frenzy but it is no mitrelinkian prescience they prove rather that greek belief that the great clashes are preceded by a louder merriment and a wilder gaiety leaping in the sunlight careless entwining clamorously joyful the waves riot on towards the verge but there they change as they turn to the sheer descent the white and blue and slate color in the heart of the canadian falls at least blend and deepen to a rich wonderful luminous green on the edge of disaster the river seems to gather herself to pause to lift a head noble in ruin and then with a slow grandeur to plunge into the eternal thunder and white chaos below where the stream runs shallower it is a kind of violet color but both violet and green fray and frill to white as they fall the mass of water striking some ever hidden base of rock leaps up the whole two hundred feet again in pinnacles and domes of spray the spray falls back into the lower river once more all but a little that finds to foam and white mist which drifts in layers along the air graining it and wanders out on the wind over the trees and gardens and houses and so vanishes the manager of one of the great power stations on the banks of the river above the falls told me that the centre of the river bed at the canadian falls is deep and of a saucer shape so it may be possible to fill this up to a uniform depth and divert a lot of water for the power houses and this he said would supply the need for more power which will certainly soon arise without taking away from the beauty of niagara this is a handsome concession of the utilitarians to ordinary sightseers yet i doubt if we shall be satisfied the real secret of the beauty and terror of the falls is not their height or width but the feeling of colossal power and of unintelligible disaster caused by the plunge of that vast body of water if that were taken away there would be little visible change but the heart would be gone the american falls do not inspire this feeling in the same way as the canadian it is because they are less in volume and because the water does not fall so much into one place by comparison their beauty is almost delicate and fragile they are extraordinarily level one long curtain of lacework and woven foam seen from opposite when the sun is on them they are blindingly white and the clouds of spray show dark against them with both falls the color of the water is the ever-altering wonder greens and blues purples and whites melt into one another fade and come again and change with the changing sun sometimes they are as richly diaphanous as a precious stone and glow from within with a deep inexplicable light sometimes the white intricacies of dropping foam become opaque and creamy and always there are the rainbows if you come suddenly upon the falls from above a great double rainbow very vivid spanning the extent of spray from top to bottom is the first thing you see if you wander along the cliff opposite a bow springs into being in the american falls accompanies you courteously on your walk dwindles and dies as the mist ends and awakens again as you reach the canadian tumult and the bold traveller who attempts the trip under the american falls sees when he dare open his eyes to anything tiny baby rainbows some four or five yards in span leaping from rock to rock among the foam and gambling beside him barely out of hand's reach as he goes one i saw in that place was a complete circle such as i have never seen before and so near that i could put my foot on it it is a terrifying journey beneath and behind the falls the senses are battered and bewildered by the thunder of the water and the assault of wind and spray or rather the sound is not of falling water but merely of falling a noise of unspecified ruin 
so if you are close behind the endless clamor the sight cannot recognize liquid in the masses that hurl past you are dimly and pitifully aware that sheets of light and darkness are falling in great curves in front of you dull omnipresent foam washes the face farther away in the roar and hissing clouds of spray seem literally to slide down some invisible plane of air beyond the foot of the falls the river is like a slipping floor of marble green with veins of dirty white made by the scum that was foam it slides very quietly and slowly down for a mile or two sullenly exhausted then it turns to a dull sage green and hurries more swiftly smooth and ominous as the walls of the ravine close in trouble stirs and the waters boil and eddy these are the lower rapids a sight more terrifying than the falls because less intelligible close in its bands of rock the river surges tumultuously forward writhing and leaping as if inspired by a demon it is pressed by the straits into a visibly convex form great plains of water slide past sometimes it is thrown up into a pinnacle of foam higher than a house or leaps with incredible speed from the crest of one vast wave to another along the shining curve between like the spring of a wild beast its motion continually suggests muscular action the power manifested in these rapids moves one with a different sense of awe and terror from that of the falls here the inhuman life and strength are spontaneous active almost resolute masculine vigor compared with the passive gigantic power female helpless and overwhelming of the falls a place of fear one is drawn back strangely to a contemplation of the falls at every hour and especially by night when the cloud of spray becomes an immense visible ghost straining and wavering high above the river white and pathetic and translucent the victorian lies very close below the surface in every man there one can sit and let great cloudy thoughts of destiny and the passage of empires drift through the mind for such dreams are at home by niagara i could not get out of my mind the thought of a friend who said that the rainbows over the falls were like the arts and beauty and goodness with regard to the stream of life caused by it thrown upon its spray but unable to stay or direct or affect it and ceasing when it ceased in all comparisons that rise in the heart of the river with its multitudinous waves and its single current likens itself to a life whether of an individual or of a community a man's life is of many flashing moments and yet one stream a nation flows through all its citizens and yet is more than they in such places one is aware with an almost insupportable and yet comforting certitude that both men and nations are hurried onwards to their ruin or ending as inevitably as this dark flood some go down to it unreluctant and meet it like the river not without nobility and as incessant as inevitable and as unavailing as the spray that hangs over the falls is the white cloud of human crying with some such thoughts does the platitudinous heart win from the confusion and thunder of a niagara peace that the quietest plains or most stable hills can never give end of essay three essay four of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay four the almost perfect state by don marquis don marquis is a real name not a pseudonym it is pronounced marquis not marquis i reprint here two of mr marquis's amiable meditations on the almost perfect state which have appeared in the column the sundial conducted by him for ten years in the new york sun 
according to the traditional motto of sundials mr marquis's orologue usually numbers only the serene hours but sometimes when the clear moonlight of his muse is shining it casts darker and even more precious shadows of satire and mysticism his many readers know by this time the depth and reach of his fun and fancy marquis is a true philosopher and wit his humour adorns a rich and mellow gravity when strongly moved he sometimes utters an epigram that rings like steel leaving the scabbard there are many things to be said against american newspapers but much of the indictment is quashed when one considers that every now and then they develop a writer like don marquis the violent haste pressure and instancy of newspaper routine purgatorial to some temperaments is a genuine stimulus to others particularly if they are able as in the case of the columnists to fall back upon outside contributors in their intervals of pessimism or sloth mr marquis's the old soak a post-prohibition portrait of a genial old tippler is perhaps the most vital bit of american humour since mr dooley some say since mark twain his prefaces and his poems will also be considered by the judicious he was born in illinois in eighteen seventy eight and did newspaper work in philadelphia and atlanta before coming to the sun in nineteen twelve one no matter how nearly perfect an almost perfect state may be it is not nearly enough perfect unless the individuals who compose it can somewhere between death and birth have a perfectly corking time for a few years the most wonderful governmental system in the world does not attract us as a system we are after a system that scarcely knows it is a system the great thing is to have the largest number of individuals as happy as may be for a little while at least some time before they die infancy is not what it is cracked up to be the child seems happy all the time to the adult because the adult knows that the child is untouched by the real problems of life if the adult were similarly untouched he is sure that he would be happy but children not knowing that they are having an easy time have a good many hard times growing and learning and obeying the rules of their elders or fighting against them are not easy things to do adolescence is certainly far from a uniformly pleasant period early manhood might be the most glorious time of all were it not that the sheer excess of life and vigour sets a fellow into continual scrapes of middle age the best that can be said is that a middle-aged person has likely learned how to have a little fun in spite of his troubles it is to old age that we look for reimbursement the most of us and most of us look in vain for the most of us have been wrenched and racked in one way or another until old age is the most trying time of all in the almost perfect state every person shall have at least ten years before he dies of easy carefree happy living things that will be so arranged economically that this will be possible for each individual personally we look forward to an old age of dissipation and indolence and unreverend disrepute in fifty years we shall be ninety-two years old we intend to work rather hard during those fifty years and accumulate enough to live on without working any more for the next ten years for we have determined to die at the age of one hundred and two during the last ten years we shall indulge ourselves in many things that we have been forced by circumstances to forego we have always been compelled and we shall be compelled for many years to come to be prudent cautious staid sober conservative industrious respectful of established institutions a model citizen we have not liked it but we have been unable to escape it our mind our logical faculties our observation inform us that the conservatives have the right side of the argument in all human affairs but the people whom we really prefer as associates though we do not approve their ideas are the rebels the radicals the wastrels the vicious the poets the bolshevists the idealists the nuts the lucifers the agreeable good-for-nothings the sentimentalists the prophets the freaks 
we have never dared to know any of them far less become intimate with them between the years of ninety-two and a hundred and two however we shall be the ribald useless drunken outcast person we have always wished to be we shall have a long white beard and long white hair we shall not walk at all but recline in a wheelchair and bellow for alcoholic beverages in the winter we shall sit before the fire with our feet in a bucket of hot water with a decanter of corn whiskey near at hand and write ribald songs against organized society strapped to one arm of our chair will be a forty five caliber revolver and we shall shoot out the lights when we want to go to sleep instead of turning them off when we want air we shall throw a silver candlestick through the front window and be damned to it we shall address public meetings to which we have been invited because of our wisdom in a vein of jocund malice we shall but we don't wish to make any one envious of the good time that is coming to us we look forward to a disreputable vigorous unhonored and disorderly old age in the meantime of course you understand you can't have us pinched and deported for our yearnings we shall know that the almost perfect state is here when the kind of old age each person wants is possible to him of course all of you may not want the kind we want some of you may prefer prunes and morality to the bitter end some of you may be dissolute now and may look forward to becoming like one of the nice old fellows in a wordsworth poem but for our part we have always been a hypocrite and we shall have to continue being a hypocrite for a good many years yet and we yearn to come out in our true colors at last the point is that no matter what you want to be during those last ten years that you may be in the almost perfect state any system of government under which the individual does all the sacrificing for the sake of the general good for the sake of the community the state gets off on its wrong foot we don't want things that cost us too much we don't want too much strain all the time the best good that you can possibly achieve is not good enough if you have to strain yourself all the time to reach it a thing is only worth doing and doing again and again if you can do it rather easily and get some joy out of it do the best you can without straining yourself too much and too continuously and leave the rest to god if you strain yourself too much you'll have to ask god to patch you up and for all you know patching you up may take time that it was planned to use some other way but overstrain yourself now and then for this reason the things you create easily and joyously will not continue to come easily and joyously unless you yourself are getting bigger all the time and when you overstrain yourself you are assisting in the creation of a new self if you get what we mean and if you should ask us suddenly just what this has to do with the picture of the old guy in the wheelchair we should answer hanged if we know but we seem to sort of run into it somehow two interplanetary communication is one of the persistent dreams of the inhabitants of this oblate spheroid on which we move breathe and suffer for lack of beer there seems to be a feeling in many quarters that if we could get speech with the martians let us say we might learn from them something to our advantage there is a disposition to concede the superiority of the fellows out there just as some americans capitulate without a struggle to poets from england rugs from constantinople song and sausage from germany religious enthusiasts from hindustan and cheese from switzerland although they have not tested the goods offered and really lack the discrimination to determine their quality almost the only foreign importations that were ever sneezed at in this country were swedish matches and spanish influenza but are the martians if martians there be any more capable than the persons dwelling between the woolworth building and the golden horn between shui dagon and the first church scientist in boston mass perhaps the martians yearn toward earth romantically poetically the romeos swearing by its light to the juliets the idealists and philosophers fabling that already there exists upon it an almost perfect state 
and now and then a wan prophet lifting his heart to its gleams as a cup to be filled from heaven with fresh waters of hope and courage for this earth it is also a star we know they are wrong about us the lovers in the far stars the philosophers poets the prophets or are they wrong they are both right and wrong as we are probably both right and wrong about them if we tumbled into mars or arcturus or sirius this evening we should find the people there discussing the shimmy the jazz the inconstancy of cooks and the iniquity of retail butchers no doubt and they would be equally disappointed by the way we flitter frivol flutter and fliver and yet that other thing would be there too that thing that made them look at our star as a symbol of grace and beauty men could not think of the almost perfect state if they did not have it in them ultimately to create the almost perfect state we used sometimes to walk over the brooklyn bridge that song in stone and steel of an engineer who was also a great artist at dusk when the tides of shadow flood in from the lower bay to break in a surf of glory and mystery and illusion against the tall towers of manhattan seen from the middle arch of the bridge at twilight new york with its girdle of shifting waters and its drift of purple cloud and its quick pulsations of unstable light is a miracle of splendor and beauty that lights up the heart like the laughter of a god but descend go down into the city mingle with the details the dirty old shed from which the l trains and trolleys put out with their jammed and mangled thousands for flattest flatbush and the unknown born of ulterior brooklyn it's still the same dirty old shed on a hot damp night the pasty streets stink like a paper hanger's overalls you are trodden and overridden by greasy little profiteers and their hopping victims you are encompassed round about by the ugly and the sordid and the objectionable is exuded upon you from a myriad candid pores your elation and your illusion vanish like ingenuous snowflakes that have kissed a hot-dog sandwich on its fiery brow and you say beauty ah what's the use and yet you have seen beauty and beauty that was created by these people and people like these you have seen the tall towers of manhattan wonderful under the stars how did it come about that such growths came from such soil that a breed lawless and sordid and prosaic has written such a mighty hieroglyphic against the sky this glamour out of a pigsty how come how is it that this hideous half-brute city is also beautiful and a fit habitation for demigods how come it comes about because the wise and subtle deities permit nothing worthy to be lost it was with no thought of beauty that the builders labored no conscious thought they were masters or slaves in the bitter wars of commerce and they never saw as a whole what they were making no one of them did but each one had had his dream and the baffled dreams and the broken visions and the ruined hopes and the secret desires of each one labored with him as he labored the things that were lost and beaten and trampled down went into the stone and steel and gave it soul the aspiration denied and the hope abandoned and the vision defeated were the things that lived and not the apparent purpose for which each one of all the millions sweat and toiled or cheated the hidden things the silent things the winged things so weak they are easily killed the unacknowledged things the rejected beauty the strangled appreciation the inchoate art the submerged spirit these groped and found each other and gathered themselves together and worked themselves into the tiles and mortar of the edifice and made a town that is a worthy fellow of the sunrise and the sea winds humanity triumphs over its details the individual aspiration is always defeated of its perfect fruition and expression but it is never lost it passes into the conglomerate being of the race 
the way to encourage yourself about the human race is to look at it first from a distance look at the lights on the high spots coming closer you will be profoundly discouraged at the number of low spots not to say two spots coming still closer you will become discouraged once more by the reflection that the same stuff that is in the high spots is also in the two spots end of essay four essay five of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay five the man o wars or husband by david w bone those who understand something of a sailor's feeling for his ship will appreciate the restraint with which captain bone describes the loss of the cameronia his command torpedoed in the mediterranean during the war you will notice forgive us for pointing out these things how quietly the quoted title pays tribute to the gallantry of the destroyers that stood by the sinking ship and the heroism of the chief officer's death is not less moving because told in two sentences this superb picture of a sea tragedy is taken from merchant men at arms a history of the british merchant service during the war a book of enthralling power and truth illustrated by the author's brother muirhead bone one of the greatest of living etchers david william bone was born in partick near glasgow in 1873 his father was a well-known glasgow journalist his great-grandfather was a boyhood companion of robert burns bone went to sea as an apprentice in the city of florence an old-time square rigger at the age of fifteen he has been at sea ever since he is now master of s s columbia of the anchor line a well-known ship in new york harbor as she has carried passengers between the clyde and the hudson for more than twenty years captain bone's fine sea tale the brass bounder published in nineteen ten has become a classic of the square sail era his broken stowage nineteen fifteen is a collection of shorter sea sketches in the long roll of great writers who have reflected the simplicity and severity of sea life captain bone will take a permanent and honourable place a sense of security is difficult of definition largely it is founded upon habit and association it is induced and maintained by familiar surroundings on board ship in a small world of our own we seem to be contained by the boundaries of the bulwarks to be sailing beyond the influences of the land and of other ships the sea is the same we have known for so long every item of our ship fitment the trim arrangement of the decks the set and rake of mast and funnel even the furnishings of our cabins has the power of impressing a stable feeling of custom normal ship life safety it requires an effort of thought to recall that in their homely presence we are endangered relating his experiences after having been mined and his ship sunk a master confided that the point that impressed him most deeply was when he went to his room for the confidential papers and saw the cabin exactly in everyday aspect his longshore clothes suspended from the hooks his umbrella standing in a corner as he had placed it on coming aboard soldiers on service are denied this aid to assurance unlike us they cannot carry their home with them to the battlefields all their scenes and surroundings are novel they may only draw a reliance and comfort from the familiar presence of their comrades at sea in a ship there is a yet greater incitement to their disquiet the movement the limitless sea the distance from the land cannot be ignored the atmosphere that is so familiar and comforting to us is to many of them an environment of dread possibilities it is with some small measure of this sense of security tempered by our knowledge of enemy activity in these waters we pace the bridge anxiety is not wholly absent some hours past we saw small flotsam that may have come from the decks of a french mail steamer torpedoed three days ago the passing of the derelict fittings aroused some disquiet 
but the steady routine of our progress and the constant friendly presence of familiar surroundings has effect in allaying immediate fears the rounds of the bridge go on the writing of the log the tapping of the glass the small measures that mark the passing of our sea hours two days out from marseilles and all is well in another two days we should be approaching the canal and then to be clear of submarine waters for a term fine weather a light wind and sea accompany us for the present but the filmy glare of the sun now low and a backward movement of the glass foretells a break ere long we are steaming at high speed to make the most of the smooth sea ahead on each bow our two escorting destroyers conform to the angles of our zigzag spurring out and swerving with the peculiar thrown around movement of their class lookout is alert and in numbers added to the watch of the ship's crew military signallers are posted the boats swung outboard have each a party of troops on guard an alarmed cry from aloft a half-uttered order to the steersman an explosion low down in the bowels of the ship that sets her reeling in her stride the upthrow comes swiftly on the moment of impact hatches coal a huge column of solid water go skyward in a hurtling mass to fall in torrent on the bridge part of a human body strikes the awning spars and hangs watchkeepers are borne to the deck by the weight of water the steersman falls limply over the wheel with blood pouring from a gash on his forehead then silence for a stunned half minute with only the thrust of the engines marking the heartbeat of the stricken ship uproar most of our men are young recruits they have been but two days on the sea the torpedo has gone hard home at the very weakest hour of our calculated drill the troops are at their evening meal when the blow comes the explosion killing many outright we had counted on a proportion of the troops being on the deck a steadying number to balance the sudden rush from below that we foresaw in emergency hurrying from the mess decks as enjoined the quick movement gathers way and intensity the decks become jammed by the pressure the gangways and passages are blocked in the struggle there is the making of a panic tuned by their outcry goro goro christ the swelling murmur is neither excited nor agonized rather the dull hopeless expression of despair the officer commanding troops has come on the bridge at the first alarm his juniors have opportunity to take their stations before the struggling mass reaches to the boats the impossibility of getting among the men on the lower decks makes the military officers efforts to restore confidence difficult they are aided from an unexpected quarter the bridge boy makes unofficial use of our megaphone hey steady up you men down there he shouts you'll not do any good for yourselves cuddling the ladders we could not have done it as well the lad is plainly in sight to the crowd on the decks a small boy undersized steady up down there the effect is instant noise there still is but the movement is arrested the engines are stopped we are now beyond range of a second torpedo and steam thunders in exhaust making our efforts to control movements by voice impossible at the moment of the impact the destroyers have swung round and are casting here and there like hounds on the scent the dull explosion of a depth charge then another rouses a fierce hope that we are not unavenged the force of the explosion has broken connections to the wireless room but the aerial still holds and when a measure of order on the boat deck allows we send a message of our peril broadcast there is no doubt in our minds of the outcome our bows drooping visibly tell that we shall not float long we have nearly three thousand on board there are boats for sixteen hundred then rafts boats rafts and the glass is falling at a rate that shows bad weather over the western horizon our drill that provided for lowering the boats with only half complements in them will not serve we pass orders to lower away in any condition however overcrowded the way is off the ship and it is with some apprehension we watch the packed boats that drop away from the davit heads 
the shrill ring of the block sheaves indicates a tension that is not far from breaking point many of the lifeboats reach the water safely with their heavy burdens but the strain on the tackles far beyond their working load is too great for all to stand to it two boats go down by the run the men in them are thrown violently to the water where they float in the wash and shattered planking a third dangles from the after fall having shot her manning out at parting of the forward tackle lowered by the stern she writes disengages and drifts aft with the men clinging to the life-lines we can make no attempt to reach the men in the water their life-belts are sufficient to keep them afloat the ship is going down rapidly by the head and there remains the second line of boats to be hoisted and swung over the chief officer pausing in his quick work looks to the bridge inquiringly as though to ask how long the fingers of two hands suffice to mark our estimate the decks are now angled to the deepening pitch of the bows pumps are utterly inadequate to make impression on the swift inflow the chief engineer comes to the bridge with a hopeless report it is only a question of time how long already the water is lapping at a level of the foredeck troops massed there and on the forecastle head are apprehensive it is indeed a wonder that their officers have held them for so long the commanding officer sets example by a cool nonchalance that we envy posted with us on the bridge his quick eyes note the flood surging in the pent between decks below from which his men have removed the few wounded the dead are left to the sea help comes as we had expected it would leaving nemesis to steam fast circles round the sinking ship rifleman swings in and brings up alongside at the forward end even in our fear and anxiety and distress we cannot but admire the precision of the destroyer captain's maneuver the skilful avoidance of our crowded lifeboats and the men in the water the sudden stoppage of her way and the cant that brings her to a standstill at the lip of our brimming decks the troops who have stood so well to orders have their reward in an easy leap to safety quickly the foredeck is cleared rifleman spurts ahead in a rush that sets the surrounding lifeboats to eddy in her wash she takes up the circling high-speed patrol and allows her sister ship to swing in and embark a number of our men it is when the most of the lifeboats are gone we realize fully the gallant service of the destroyers there remain the rafts but many of these have been launched over to aid the struggling men in the water half an hour has passed since we were struck thirty minutes of frantic endeavor to debark our men yet still the decks are thronged by a packed mass that seems but little reduced the coming of the destroyers alters the outlook rifleman's action has taken over six hundred a sensible clearance nemesis swings in with the precision of an express and the thud and clatter of the troops jumping to her deck sets up a continuous drumming note of deliverance alert and confident the naval men accept the great risks of their position the ship's bows are entered to the water at a steep incline every minute the balance is weighing casting her stern high in the air the bulkheads are by now taking place of keel and bearing the huge weight of her on the water at any moment she may go without a warning to crash into the light hull of the destroyer and bear her down for all the circling watch of her sister ship the submarine if still he lives may get in a shot at the standing target it is with a deep relief we signal the captain to bear off her decks are jammed to the limit she can carry no more nemesis lists heavily under her burdened decks as she goes ahead and clears forty minutes the zigzag clock in the wheelhouse goes on ringing the angles of time and course as though we were yet under helm and speed for a short term we have noted that the ship appears to have reached a point of arrest in her foundering droop she remains upright as she has been since righting herself after the first inrush of water 
like the lady she always was she has added no fearsome list to the sum of our distress the familiar bridge on which so many of our safe sea days have been spent is canted at an angle that makes foothold uneasy she cannot remain for long afloat the end will come swiftly without warning a sudden rupture of the bulkhead that is sustaining her weight we are not now many left on board striving and wrenching to manhandle the only remaining boat rendered idle for want of the tackles that have parted on service of its twin we succeed in pointing her outboard and await a further deepening of the bows ere launching her of the military the officer commanding some few of his juniors a group of other ranks stand by the senior officers of the ship a muster of seamen a few stewards are banded with us at the last we expect no further service of the destroyers the position of the ship is over menacing to any approach they have all they can carry steaming at a short distance they have the appearance of being heavily overloaded each has a staggering list and lies low in the water under their deck encumbrance we have only the hazard of a quick outthrow of the remaining boat and the chances of a grip on floating wreckage to count upon on a sudden swift sheer rifleman takes the risk unheeding our warning hail she steams across the bows and backs at a high speed her rounded stern jars on our hull plates a whaler and the davits catch on a projection and give with the ring of buckling steel she turns on the throw of the propellers and closes aboard with a resounding impact that sets her living deck-load to stagger we lose no time scrambling down the life ropes our small company endeavors to get foothold on her decks the destroyer widens off at the rebound but by clutch of friendly hands the men are dragged aboard one fails to reach safety a soldier loses grip and goes to the water the chief officer follows him tired and unstrung as he must be by the devoted labors of the last half hour he is in no condition to effect a rescue a sudden deep rumble from within the sinking ship warns the destroyer captain to go ahead we are given no chance to aid our shipmates the propellers tear the water in a furious race that sweeps them away and we draw off swiftly from the side of the ship we are little more than clear of the settling fore end when the last buoyant breath of cameronia is overcome nobly she has held afloat to the debarking of the last man there is no further life in her evenly steadily as we had seen her leave the launching ways at meadowside she goes down end of essay five essay six of modern essays selected by christopher morley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay six: The Market by William McPhee. William McPhee's name is associated with the sea, but in his writing he treats the life of ships and sailors more as a background than as the essential substance of his tale. I have chosen this brief and colorful little sketch to represent his talent because it is different from the work with which most of his readers are familiar and because it represents a mood very characteristic of him an imaginative and observant treatment of the workings of commerce his interest in fruit is intimate as he has been for some years an engineer in the sea service of the united fruit company with a mediterranean interim reflected in much of his recent writing during the war the publication of mcphee's a casuals of the sea in nineteen sixteen was something of an event in the world of books and introduced to the reading world a new writer of unquestionable strength and subtlety his earlier books an ocean tramp and aliens both republished since had gone almost unnoticed which it is safe to say will not happen again to anything he cares to publish his later books are captain macedon's daughter harbors of memory and an engineer's notebook 
he was born at sea in eighteen eighty one the son of a sea captain grew up in a northern suburb of london served his apprenticeship in a big engineering shop and has been in ships most of the time since nineteen o five there is a sharp imperative rap on my outer door a rap having within its insistent urgency a shadow of delicate diffidence as though the person responsible were a trifle scared of the performance and on tiptoe to run away i roll over and regard the clock four forty one of the dubious by-products of continuous service as a senior assistant at sea is the habit of waking automatically about four a m this gives one several hours when ashore to meditate upon one's sins frailties and more rarely triumphs and virtues for a man who gets up at say four thirty is regarded with aversion ashore his family express themselves with superfluous vigour he must lie still and meditate or suffer the ignominy of being asked when he is going away again but this morning in these old chambers in an ancient inn buried in the heart of london city i have agreed to get up and go out the reason for this momentous departure from a life of temporary but deliberate indolence is a lady cherchez la femme as the french say with the dry animosity of a logical race well she is not far to seek being on the outside of my heavy oak door tapping as already hinted with a sharp insistent delicacy to this romantic summons i reply with an articulate growl of acquiescence and proceed to get ready to relieve the anxiety of any reader who imagines an impending elopement it may be stated in succinct truthfulness that we are bound on no such desperate venture we are going round the corner a few blocks up the strand to covent garden market to see the arrival of the metropolitan supply of produce having accomplished a hasty toilette almost as primitive as that favoured by gentlemen aroused to go on watch and placating an occasional repetition of the tapping by brief protests and reports of progress i take hat and cane and drawing the huge antique bolts of my door discover a young woman standing by the window looking out upon the quadrangle of the old inn she is a very decided young woman who is continually thinking out what she calls stunts for articles in the press that is her profession or one of her professions writing articles for the press the other profession is selling manuscripts which constitutes the tender bond between us for the usual agent's commission she is selling one of my manuscripts being an unattached and as it were unprotected male she plans little excursions about london to keep me instructed and entertained here she is attired in the flamboyant finery of a london flower-girl she is about to get the necessary copy for a special article in a morning paper with the exception of a certain expectant flash of her bright black irish eyes she is entirely business-like commenting on the beauty of an early summer morning in town we descend and passing out under the ponderous ancient archway we make our leisurely progress westward down the strand london is always beautiful to those who love and understand that extraordinary microcosm but at five of a summer morning there is about her an exquisite quality of youthful fragrance and debonair freshness which goes to the heart the newly hosed streets are shining in the sunlight as though paved with patines of bright gold early buses rumble by from neighbouring barns where they have spent the night and as we near the new gaiety theatre thrusting forward into the great rivers of traffic soon to pour round its base like some bold byzantine promontory we see waterloo bridge thronged with wagons piled high from all quarters they are coming past charing cross the great wains are arriving from paddington terminal from the market garden section of middlesex and surrey down wellington street come carts laden with vegetables from brentwood and cogshall 
and neat vans packed with crates of watercress which grows in the lush lowlands of suffolk and cambridgeshire and behind us are thundering huge four-horse vehicles from the docks vehicles with peaches from south africa potatoes from the canary islands onions from france apples from california oranges from the west indies pineapples from central america grapes from spain and bananas from colombia we turn in under an archway behind a theatre and adjacent to the stage door of the opera house the booths are rapidly filling with produce gentlemen in long alpaca coats and carrying formidable marbled notebooks walk about with an important air a mountain range of pumpkins rises behind a hill of cabbages festoons of onions are being suspended from rails the heads of barrels are being knocked in disclosing purple grapes buried in cork dust pears and figs grown under glass for wealthy patrons repose in soft tissue-lined boxes a broken crate of tangerine oranges has spilled its contents in a splash of ruddy gold on the plank runway a wagon is driven in a heavy load of beets and the broad wheels crush through the soft fruit so that the air is heavy with the acrid sweetness we pick our way among the booths and stalls until we find the flowers here is a crowd of ladies young so-so and some quite matronly and all dressed in this same flamboyant finery of which i have spoken they are grouped about an almost overpowering mass of blooms roses just now predominate there is a satisfying solidity about the bunches a glorious abundance which in a commodity so easily enjoyed without ownership is scarcely credible i feel no desire to own these huge aggregations of odorous beauty it would be like owning a harem one imagines violets solid patches of vivid blue in round baskets eglantine in dainty boxes provide a foil to the majestic blazonry of the roses and the dew-spangled forest of maidenhair fern near by and what are those things at all demands my companion diverted for a moment from the flowers she nods towards a mass of dull green affairs piled on mats or being lifted from big vans she is a cockney and displays surprise when she is told those things are bananas she shrugs and turns again to the musk roses and forgets but to me as the harsh penetrating odor of the green fruit cuts across the heavy perfume of the flowers comes a picture of the farms in distant colombia or perhaps costa rica there is nothing like an odor to stir memories i see the timber pier and the long line of rackety open slatted cars jangling into the dark shed pushed by a noisy squealing locomotive i see the boys lying asleep between shifts their enormous straw hats covering their faces as they sprawl in the distance rise the blue mountains behind is the motionless blue sea i hear the whine of the elevators the monotonous click of the counters the harsh cries of irresponsible and argumentative natives i feel the heat of the tropic day and see the gleam of the white waves breaking on yellow sands below tall palms i recall the mysterious impenetrable solitude of the jungle a solitude alive if one is equipped with knowledge with a ceaseless warfare of winged and crawling hosts and while my companion is busily engaged in getting copy for a special article about the market i step nimbly out of the way of a swarthy gentleman from calabria who with his two-wheeled barrow is the last link in the immense chain of transportation connecting the farmer in the distant tropics and the cockney pedestrian who halts on the sidewalk and purchases a banana for a couple of pennies End of Essay 6